Some letters and apologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Through a Scottish Prism. Uh, it's lovely to be with you again. And we're here today in the Granite City up in Aberdeen in the Rusty Nail. A nice crowd in. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for taking the time out of your day to come and see us. I hope you enjoy, um, as much as I know we are going to enjoy answering your questions. Uh, but if I could just immediately uh, introduce my, my panel. In the far right, I've got Gavin Bain, the convener of the Alba Party Aberdeen City Branch. Our favourite lawyer and the Independence for Independent candidate for Allo and Grangemouth, Eva Comrie. Yeah. And on my immediate left we've got Charlie Abel, a prospective candidate for the Alba party in a seat yet to be determined. Am I right? Yeah. And from the Scottish National Party and Edinburgh we've got Lloyd Quinnan. And as always, uh, through a Scottish Prism, will continue to be um, open to all parties and anyone that supports independence. We make no discrimination. We are completely agnostic when it comes to independence, because that is why we're all here. And I, of course, am Roddy McLeod, a.k.a. Barhead Boy. Welcome. Really? Now, we've, we've been touring Scotland uh, for this month, and we've, it's been fantastic reception. And we, we finished in Perth on Wednesday, for any of you who have watched the show, and we didn't get round to answering all the questions. And I did promise our good friends in, in Perth that um, I would get some of these questions out. So if you don't mind, I'll start with a couple of the Perth questions. Um, and it's quite a good one anyway to get started. Um, and it's the GRRB bill failed. Um, we've now got, do we think the hate crime will be overturned and uh, repealed. Lloyd, start with you. Uh, I hope so. But uh, as I've said many times before, I think that the hate crime bill and the GRRB can't really be separated. They're ideological. They're being imposed on people. Uh, and one is, the, is effectively the, the safety net for the other. I think it's ill-conceived. I don't have met a lawyer yet he thinks that this, uh, this legislation can, in fact, be properly uh, empowered. Uh, but I, I also know very well from the, the voting that took place on this bill that the members of the Scottish Parliament who voted for it do not have the intelligence at this particular stage to, to bin it, which is where it deserves to be. Uh, I think some of the actions that people intend to take as of April the 1st, I think, will expose the flaws that are in it. Uh, I also worry that what we're doing is we're having a, a politicisation of the police force for no good reason whatsoever. I think our police are massively overstretched. I think our courts are massively overstretched. Uh, they're still catching up from all the, the, the problems created by COVID. So, I hope they've been it, but I think they're going to dig their heels in as they have with other things until eventually a court case brings it crashing down. Thank okay. you. Charlie, what do you think? Well, I think the, the hate crime bill is legislation that's court and disaster, and uh, it's destined for the dustbin, even if it is there, even the police are, are uh, not keen on it at all. And the, the the advent of the hate monster. <laughs> I mean, that, that brings a smile to my face, really. It was so badly done. And if they wanted to do something better, maybe they should have done it in Doric rather than that fake Scots they used in that advert. Can, can you imagine the hate crime money coming on then? I'm for you up, dog. Get you tomorrow, or I'll sort you. Get you know something like that, it would have been at least a bit more funny. But the legislation, just absolute nonsense, and it's just. Uh, a sign that where this current leadership in the SNP is taking us, I think. We need, we need to get the grown ups back in the room. Yeah. Cheers. Gavin, what's your view on the, the hate crime bill? Do you think it will survive? I'm, I'm afraid that it might for a while. And, and I, think, I think 
it, it's likely to be repealed eventually because it looks like a, a dog's breakfast as a piece of legislation. But it's going to do some damage until that day. And, and I worry what happens uh, as, as it starts to be introduced, how many people are going to find themselves uh, detained uh, under it and unjustifiably prosecuted for, for having an opinion. Um, it's having a, already having a chilling effect on, on debate. Um, and I think it's deeply worrying. Um, it, it can't stand, but it's going to do some damage until the day that it falls, and I, and I worry about that period. Thank you. Eva, equality has just been your thing for a long while. There's no glory attached to any political party in Scotland in relation to this legislation. And I don't intend to be controversial for the entire programme, but I have to stress, Ash Reagan voted for the hate crime legislation. She supported it in Parliament when she was an SNP minister. And for that reason, and for many others, I think the Alba Party actually needs to make a comprehensive statement about what their position actually is on the legislation. That is needed, and it's needed for people like me who are gender critical, and it's needed for the women that support the Alba Party who may not understand what's going on and why there appears to have been a change of heart. However, um, don't take it from me. If you go online, you'll see a really good video that was released earlier today um, by The Times, and it's an interview of Callum Steele, former um, General Secretary of the Police Federation, and he refers to how the police are likely to be used as no more than a playground monitor. And the issue about this is that it is unlikely that there will be a lot of prosecutions or convictions. There'll be a few. There won't be terribly many because the threshold for criminality is not particularly low. What there will be will be a number of vexatious complaints because it's absolutely plain that an anonymous complainer can make a complaint and never be identified to the person that they're complaining about. That drives a coach and horses through all human rights and liberty legislation. It is completely wrong. We are entitled to know how our accusers may be and this legislation enables that no longer to be the case. So it's not a laughing matter when you think that you can report a hate crime in a sex shop. Um, you're not allowed to do it at a mushroom farm anymore, but there are plenty of other places that you can report it because they're third party reporting centres that apparently we've had in Scotland for years, but nobody knows how or why and when they came about. You really have to ask yourself, what the hell's gone wrong in Scotland in the last few years under Sturgeon and Yusuf? Because it is cringingly, embarrassingly, bloody downright dangerous. I am not going to jail for saying a man is a man for all that, but I will be continuing to say it loudly and clearly, and hell mend anybody that thinks I can do that. Yeah, can, 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 can I just come back? I mean, I, the other party has made a statement on this. Um, there's two important points I'll just read out really quickly. Uh, the first is to protect and maintain the equality before the law in line with the ECHR and uh, extend quality and human rights uh, statute, so that's important. Uh, and also, uh, we call on the Scottish Government to postpone the operational introduction of the Hate Crime and, and Public Order Act uh, until it can be amended and we can fix some of the um, dafter aspects of the, of, of the course. So, we, so that, that, that has been made. That makes sense, but unfortunately I worry that the Scottish Government haven't got the sense. Well, they're not going to be doing that between now and Monday, so mm. Monday it's happening, so yeah. uh, we are where we are. We'll see. Sure. Can I just... Uh, everything, uh, the last part of what Eva said, of course, I agree with, but the first part attacking uh, Ash Reagan, I don't, because while she was a minister of the Scottish Government, she would have really had no choice in, in that legislation, but since she's actually sacrificed the trappings of ministerial office to stand up for women's rights, and I think she's one of the few people who've done that, and I think that should be commended. No comments from the floor? Yep. Down here, Alan Petrie. I think what we've just heard yeah, there... Just Hazel comes with the microphone, Alan, please. Yeah, I mean, I think what we've just heard there is the reason so many people are going to go for independent candidates now, because people won't be bound by a whip. Well, let's hope. I would just like to add, there were four abstentions uh, at the time that the bill was passed, and the abstainers were Neil Finlay of Labour, John McAlpine of the SNP, Mark MacDonald, who had by then become independent, and Alec Neil from the SNP. 
So we should never forget those four people who laid their careers on the line. Teresa. Um, one of the sly ways that the Scottish Government got that bill through though, and bear in mind it was three years ago, that they promised they would engage with women's groups about their concerns. And all that time, the women's groups were writing to them, asking for meetings, and they were lied to. They were rebuffed and pushed away, and they would not engage with them. So, hey-ho, you learn from false promises from your leader on high, don't you? Yeah. Actually, false promises are the lies. <laughs> Roddy, can I, can I just briefly say, one of, the, one of the issues that's become clear about this is that the current Scottish Government is operating in such a bubble of its own. You've had two government ministers in the past 10 days state to the public that Scotland is a country filled with hate. Now, how do they come to these conclusions? Is it because they themselves feel so completely under pressure because they know that they're producing law that is not wanted by the population? Or are they operating on bits of paper that are given to them by civil servants and also by the organisation and groups that they fund that are entirely behind this hate crime bill? It's, it's, it's deeply worrying when we have politicians that we've elected going on television and telling the country that we are living in a country that is filled with hate. It's certainly not the country that I recognise, and maybe that's the real problem, as these people have lost sight entirely of the country that they are supposed to be governing, and have completely lost contact with the population and the citizenry of the country. I've got a sort of supplementary question here. I've got a funny feeling it might be from Heather. Yeah. It, <laughs> and, and it's, uh, I, I think it's referring to the, the Al, Al, Albin school teacher headmaster today. Is it part no, of that? Just, it's just the general, okay. Just the general. And the question is teaching, teachers are often the victims of false and malicious accusations by disgruntled pupils and parents, and they're usually exonerated thanks to due process. Are, the right to, are we right to be concerned about the implications of the hate crime bill, which does not require such stringent investigation and process? Charlie. Yeah, I don't know much about the case you're talking about, uh, but the, the hate crime bill is uh, just a mess. And I, th I, th I think if everybody stands up and just sticks by their themselves, like uh, Jim Siller said the other day, it'll have to go away. I mean, you can't have the police not invest, not doing stuff with the uh, robberies and yeah. theft and all the rest, and what they're meant to be doing, like tackling crime, and then they end up messing about because somebody's feelings are hurt or whatever. You know, and it'll be used maliciously. Oh, for sure. Definitely, and that'll start next week. I think you've seen some people tweeting things about what they're intending and doing next week already, so we'll see what happens. Yeah. Oh. Gavin, do you think the teachers need to be concerned about this hate crime bill? Yes, I do. Um, I mean, I, I don't know in detail what the what the operational guidelines are um, being given to, to the police and, and those who will prosecute. But even if you don't go as far as a prosecution, you, you, you've got this... Um, um, you know, uh, non-crime hate statistic being recorded against people. Um, so, so, and that and that's going to come up again as people get vetted for jobs, particularly around teaching and any any jobs uh, involved with children and, and, and vulnerable people. So it's, it's deeply worrying that you're going to put a mark on people's record for no good reason, uh, no no recourse, um, and, and people will weaponize this. Uh, for all for, for their own agenda and um, yes yeah, it's, it's deeply worrying uh, there needs to be proper process that's something we used to be good at in this country and uh, it, it's alarming to see how far that's been eroded uh, children can be very cruel uh, as we know should teachers be concerned teachers should be very worried when you consider the context of transgender guidance for schools 
because that guidance, which was implemented by the Scottish local authorities on the instructions of the Scottish Government, so that the local authorities were carrying the can and were blamed when it went wrong, that guidance would, in conjunction with the Hate Crime Act, lead to teachers being reported and being criminalised if they are considered to have misgendered a child. Now, misgendering is not a criminal offence, but these are the sorts of complaints that will inevitably be made. And if you're a teacher or a pupil in your class who claims to be transgender, you're not going to know how to deal with this, because naturally you should not be affirming a change of a child's gender because there is no such thing as a trans child despite those who believe in the goodness uh, and the advantages of such as puberty blockers. But if you're a teacher who refuses to recognise a child's desire to alter their gender or alter their sex and you don't want to affirm that position, you want to remind them of the, the sex that they are and you call them by their own name and you refer to them as a boy or as a girl, I have no doubt that you'll be reported you'll probably be disciplined and you'll certainly have recorded against you a non-hate crime incident when you are eventually exonerated. But you'll go under an awful lot of pressure and a lot of strain for a year or two while the police have your devices and you're probably suspended from work, left languishing at home because some nutcase somewhere thought that there was anything remotely sensible in any of this legislation. On the point of hate crime, the most recent hate crime statistics show that hate crimes committed in Scotland in the past year are lower than they were 10 years earlier. We don't need this legislation. I don't really have much more to say than, than, than what I've already said. That, that, that this, is a, this is a product of people who are operating to somebody else's agenda, and that agenda was partly created during the First Ministership of Nicola Sturgeon, where she created a third sector of the equality, diversity and inclusion, which has created a, a whole industry for itself. It needs to effectively keep itself in work, and the Hate Crime Bill fits with, with, with that structure. Without the, uh, the, the many, many middle-class professionals that are now operating within the equality, uh, diversity and inclusion business, uh, much like the, the, the poverty business, and I've said this before as well, until you get rid of the equality business, the diversity business and the inclusion business, then we're not addressing any of those three issues. They will constantly move around to find new, new structures by which they can employ themselves and indeed criminalise people. Because effectively what's happening here is that if you do not go along with the theories and the ideologies of these newly created professionals and these newly created businesses, then you're a baddie. And from what we've heard from Scottish Government ministers the past couple of weeks is, effectively everybody in this room and most of the population of the country are already baddies. Uh, I don't know who put in this question, but it's kind of topical. It's along the same lines, um, and it's to ask. I'll start with you, if I may, Gavin. What is the ALBA position uh, on free ports? Ah. Um, well, I, I believe formally there was a motion passed at uh, at conference uh, against free ports, but I do note that um, uh, one of our recent recruits to the to the um, uh, uh, party has been a quite a prominent advocate of free ports. So I'm looking forward to uh, an interest, genuinely interesting discussion at our at our next spring conference, where we um, uh, discuss that and, and and come to a conclusion. Um, the, the the issue that um, has set us against free ports has been the erosion of workers' rights, the the creation of uh, uh, complicated legislative enclaves where you know they might be difficult to unpick in the future and, and create unnecessary complexity. Um, and don't seem to be um, geared around uh, generating benefits and an economic boost that you would you would expect them to be. Um, so that's that's the concerns that we have on record. Um, I do expect the next conference to have on the agenda some some discussion points of that, given given that we've uh, just recruited a prominent advocate, and I look forward to those discussions. Excellent, Charlie. Uh, I'll uh, Alba are against uh, free ports in principle, uh, but we would advocate the public ownership of many of the port facilities around our country. 
uh, that are not community or trust owned. Uh, it should be recognised, however, that the Cromarty Freeport uh, has not been quite as bad as the, the thought. There was some mitigating uh, parts to that fears. Uh, Highland Council have, have been appointed the accountable body, for example. A real living wage is, is there and that applies. And so do uh, the new planning frameworks. But there is a tax exemption for national insurance of 25 grand, but that's replaced by an employee levy which is more money that comes to the Scottish government in that area than it would have if it went to the London Treasury. So that initially sounds like it might be a bad thing, but in a way it can be a good thing. I'm not saying whether we support free ports, I'm just saying that some of the bad things that were predicted didn't actually happen in that in this case, but it's something we all need to learn more about. But uh, like I say, in principle, I'm opposed to three ports. I think we should be concentrating on independence and getting that done. <laughs> Eva, you're, you're, the seat you're standing in, Alan and Gradewell, is going to be in a free port area now. It's not Alba's policy, but what's your policy on it? I'll just quote you a wee bit from the Alba policy, because there was a resolution that was, um, I think, written or proposed by Morgan Davis and seconded by Jackie Beister. And the conclusion was... Alba calls on the Scottish Government to cease the development of green freeports in Scotland and to reject the UK Government's promotion and development of freeports. That remains my view, um, absolutely. And what I'm really concerned about, and I want to give you the specific numbers, is the size of the freeport. And there's another good item from Indie Scott News about freeports. They're neither free nor are they green, and they're not ports. The fourth green port, which includes Grangemouth, begins west of Falkirk, goes as far east as Leith, takes in a whole load of Fife and the Lothians, 70% of Edinburgh and also Edinburgh Airport. By no stretch of the imagination is that sustainable. It just should not be happening. The secrecy around these free ports is another dreadful red flag. There's a lot of stuff going on that is very negative, not good for the people of Scotland, and the Scottish Government, if not acquiescing in it, they are promoting free ports as being something positive for the country when they are everything that's wrong. And the SNP tend to forget that if you have free ports in your country, you're not allowed into the EU. I know it's your party policy, but you don't agree with it, do you? <laughs> it's a, I think it's well, so I say, is there any policy apart from independence you do agree with? <laughs> I think I'd have to go through my files to find one. <laughs> uh, I live in a freeport, or I'm going to live in a freeport. Um, the central issue is it removes the sovereignty of our parliament, our local councils, and the sovereignty of each of one of us as an individual. The, the real danger here is that our politicians are sleepwalking into this. They're buying the story. We've got too many people who walk into a room full of millionaires and think that millionaires are better than them. They forget that who they're representing is usually between 30 and 40,000 people. And those 40,000 people are a damn sight more important than any millionaire sitting in any room, anywhere. <laughs> Last week, Michael Gove, remember that all of this legislation, irrespective of what members of the Scottish Parliament say, they have no locus on this whatsoever, other than to nod their heads and say, OK. That's, that's their involvement, from top to bottom. Last week, Michael Gove, who is primarily in charge of the creation of the free ports and the, the local economic zones in England, pushed through an order which allows compulsory purchase, and that applies in Scotland too. Any of the free port areas now have the legal basis to compulsory purchase land, houses, anything they like. In our Freeport, the Great Freeport is called the Fourth Freeport, we have Black Rock, who are essentially a part of the Great American Military Industrial Complex, now own Edinburgh Airport and they are on the board of the Freeport, as it stands at the moment, the, the interim board. That's deeply worrying. Every part of the, of the, the Fourth Freeport takes in most of the economic activity, export and import that happens in this country. We'll all be within that Freeport area. You have Moss Morn gas cracking plant. 
the Grangemouth Refinery and the Plastics uh, Division at, at Grangemouth. The Edinburgh Bio Quarter, that's had huge investment put into it because that's one of the big things that we have, developing research and development in biosciences. And that was going to be, if you look back in the manifestos, that was going to be the great economic driver for the second half of the 21st century. All of that has been taken out of our economy and handed over entirely to the freeports. The biggest danger to us, though, is this. At the moment, I'm not aware, I don't know if you're aware of this, but Honduras, which has had a, a free port for about 15 years now, has realised that that free port is draining all the economic value out of their economy. It's crushing down wages, it's effectively bankrupting the country that it, that it is in. So they've decided, the Honduran government, that they don't want the free port anymore. So they're now locked in a legal battle that has cost them already upwards of $4 billion dollars and is going to continue to because the international laws say that when you agree to a free port, it is for a minimum of 25 years. And you cannot get out unless you pay compensation. And that compensation is dictated by the free port owners. Do we want, when we move to independence, unless we want to wait 25 years? Does the SNP want to wait 25 years until the end of the free port agreement? Because that's what we're going to have to do. Either that or we again, yet again, we start off on day one of independence entirely hobbled by the fact that the majority of our economy is controlled by outside forces. Any independence party anywhere in the world wants a blank sheet of paper so that we can rebuild our country as we come out of this corrupted union, so that we can address the central social and economic issues that have cursed this country for the past, oh, say 300 years if you want, but certainly the past 60 years. All of that, all of that is out of our hands. How can the party that supposedly stands for the independence of our country and the freedom of our people hand over our economy for 25 years? They're not telling themselves the truth, never mind telling us the truth. I saw yesterday Yet another statement from the First Minister about us rejoining the European Union. Well, that ain't happening. You cannot join the European Union if you have a free port. We will have two minimum. And there's suggestions that we'll have some of these local economic zones as well, potentially on the West Coast. This is a curse on the country. And again, shows these people don't do their homework. They let the civil servants do the homework for them and they forget. The civil service in Scotland is the British civil service. It serves Britain. That is its function. It leads me nicely onto another question actually we got down in Perth from Murray Duncan. And it says, uh, I'll start with you for me, Eva. 70% of Scottish wealth is owned by 1% of the population. How do you start to reverse that trend? You immediately think of, sorry, you immediately think of the 784 Theatre Company and the TV at the Stag and the Black Black Oil when you hear these figures. I, I'm 61, I'll be 62 this year, and I was probably in primary school when, when the TV came out. Nothing much has changed. Um, the difficulty Scotland has is that at the moment we are governed by clowns and fools. They do not have the political will to address poverty and want. They appear not to have the political will to actually address the independence question. So the answer to our ills is independence, we know that. And we know that how to make our country prosperous is to tackle our greatest scourge, which is poverty and inequality. And we know how to do that. Everybody in this room knows how to do it. It's about respect and recognising that everybody, every person in their country matters. The most vulnerable probably matter a bit more, but what we ought to have is a position whereby everybody is entitled to a warm home which they can afford to heat and they can afford to eat. We should have a universal basic income. We should have welfare benefits that are paid at a humane level and not at an insultingly low level. We should have an NHS that is free for all at time of need, literally cradle to grave. When we're independent, 
we can have that National House Building Corporation and a National Energy Company. We won't have rotten nuclear subs at Rosyth and we won't have weapons of mass destruction on the Clyde. You think of the amount of money that is squandered in the UK today and the money Scotland sends south to Westminster and we get a pittance back. If we're going to carry on accepting this position, we might as well all hand over our pay packets to our next door neighbours and ask them to look after us on our behalf, because that's what Scotland continues to do. And the way out of that today, and every day until it happens, is for every independence-minded person in the country to demand that every independence-minded politician or candidate stands on a platform of independence, nothing less. And if that happened, we would have Scotland United this year, we would be independent before Hogmanay, and you could be singing, Scots wa hey, or for all lang sign in an independent Scotland, this hog my name. Oh, I'm ready to go to war. Gavin. Oh, how to follow that? Yeah. You go with me, just do the best you can. <laughs> so I, I strongly agree with uh, uh, pretty much everything you, Eva said there. Um, uh, until Scotland is um, uh, governed uh, with, the, with the objective of doing what's best for Scotland, we're, we're never going to get there. These grand notions come and go. Um, you see promising initiatives on land reform and setting up institutions that, that don't go far enough. And they can't go far enough because we don't have all the levers in our control. And, and that's one of the key reasons that we need those levers in our control. And Scotland needs to be governed by the people who um, can do it best. That's the people who live here. Well, and the common thread in all our problems is that if we're not independent, if we were independent, we would be able to do what we want with our economy that would work for the people of Scotland. We'd have our resources, we'd probably have the cheapest, if not even a dream of free energy, because we've got so much. When I've always thought this big cable that they're doing to siphon off all our resources, you know the one that, from Peterhead taking all the stuff? down south. I just think as soon as we're independent, the first thing we should do is get a great big prepayment meter and stick it at the top of that cable. <laughs> That'll pay for all your electric. No. And then we can go forwards for there. That that's your way to eradicate poverty. You'd you'd create jobs, you'd 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 have the investment stay in here and you'd if there's a tax system that we create it will be fair and there'll be no way to hide your money in offshore bank accounts for the poor subsidises the rich at the time, because that's what's been happening. Here we go. <laughs> As I came up on the bus this morning, I, I heard a, a report on, on uh, Radio Scotland, and it was about the fact that we've got three local councils in Scotland that declared a, a housing emergency, and they were comparing the uh, the situation of the housing emergency in Scotland with the situation in the city of Vienna, where they pointed out that in Vienna there are 900,000 accommodation units owned by the city council, and that the general attitude in Vienna is renting a place is fine. You don't have to get on the housing market. You don't have to cripple yourself with, with debt. And that's a general attitude right across the, the, the whole of Europe. But there was mystification from the, uh, the BBC journalist at this idea that, uh, because they're all very young in BBC Scotland these days, that a, that a city council would own so much property and would build so many homes. And it made me think exactly about what Eva has been saying for a while. The National House Building Company that was supposed to be set up many years ago by the Scottish Government is a central part of developing a fresh new economy at the same time as delivering on one of the essential needs for the people of our country. Far too many people are homeless, far too many people are living in substandard accommodation and far too many people are being exploited by private landlords. A National House Building Company is an initiative that would both put people back to work we give people an improved standard of living simply by having a decent place to live. That's not addressing the, the other issues, but what it would do is it would kick-start 
a sense, I believe, in social pride and a, a sense of, of, of community as well, which we've lost. And we've lost it because we've gone down the road that Thatcher created of selling off council houses and saying to everybody, you can be rich. And we know, 50 years later, that that was a complete illusion. Because all it's done is it's made an awful lot of people have ambition to be rich, but at the same time, cursing themselves with a huge, huge amount of debt. That's why so many people are homeless. If you get into the whole business of, 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 of property ownership, what you're ultimately doing is you're threatening your own future. And what we need to do is we need to remove that mindset, which is not a natural product of our society. It may be the product of the society of the southeast of England, but it's not the product here. As a result of that, we have depopulation still going on in our country. Our younger people, particularly in rural areas and particularly in the islands, both the Northern Isles and the, the Western Isles, are forced by the lack of community-owned housing to leave. And when they leave, they never go back. Which is why our country has become a bit like the Chidi at the Stag and the Black Black Oil, except we don't get the oil, somebody else gets the benefit for the Cheviot and somebody else shoots the stags on our landscape, which is empty because there is no housing for our young people. For me, that's the answer, the essential answer to, 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 to get our sense of community back, to, to kickstart the economy. It has to be done on, not on the basis of someone coming in with investment, but us recognising the needs of the people of our country, employing those people to do things that benefit those people. That's independence. I, I, I've got sort of two questions here that can be sort of put into one. Um, it's quite a, a lot large. The first one is from, it's from Trish McPherson and Peterhead. Um, and it's the, the Yes Movement um, of 2014. Many Scottish independence supporters believe that the Yes branding equates to independence. However, there is no uh, Yes organisation anymore. People are labouring under a misapprehension. Since the SP SNP took the branding over, there is currently no umbrella organisations. Mm. Um, well, there wasn't um, for Scots to continue to fight for independence. Do the panel think that the independent supporters and the YES groups realise all the YES links originate back to the SNP party only? Um, and when they donate money, it's going to the SNP only and not to the wider independence movement? And uh, for example, Trish's own party, the Alapa party, their team were encouraged to turn out for an SNP day of action, branded a YES day. But when they looked at it, all the printed material linked back solely to the SNP. Um, the language with the word we use in Scotland is I. It's been more, t more than 10 years on from the referendum. Um, we should refuse to submit anglification to our language and the watering down of our own culture. Campaign with yes groups, but is it time to call them I, or is it I for Indy? Which uh, brings me on to a second question, which kind of links in with that, which is Indy First, which was launched this week, is an opportunity to unite the yes movement. Why are the political parties not supporting it? Start with you on that one, Eva. Unfortunately, the party political system is such that most party politicians are accused of putting party before country. And perhaps some party politicians find it difficult to put country before party. And Indy First is all about country before party. Um, you'll notice that I said some party politicians, not everybody, because we have been contacted by some party politicians who are very, very pleased to see the end of first development, and that can only be a good thing. I completely take Trisha's point in relation to the yes campaign and yes symbolism now, and I agree, Trish, you've brought to attention of all the viewers and everybody here that contributing to yes with a multicoloured symbol is a contribution to the SNP. And it's unfortunate that it doesn't actually make that clear when people are donating or helping them. And that's not to say you shouldn't assist yes or the SNP, 
But if you want to make a contribution towards independence, then I would suggest what I said earlier. Speak to your MPs and your political candidates and talk to them about the merits of independence and the merits of I and the merits of putting independence at the top line of every manifesto and actually meaning it. That would include... <laughs> it must be watching. That would include requiring Pete Wisher to explain how he gets his party out of what he describes as an awful mess. <laughs> Uh, Gavin. Um, I, I've never thought that any one party should or could own the independence movement. Um, I think it's something that ultimately has to be grasped by the people and uh, parties can play in that space and they can garner support and they can work to convince people but it's the people of Scotland that will move, move this forward. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll sit beside and behind and, and support anybody who's got that objective. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't have to agree with them on every topic to, to um, stand shoulder to shoulder with them on independence. And I think most of the people that, that, that I come into contact with are, are, the same, are of the same mind. So I don't, I don't think the, 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 the branding or an organisation is that important. I don't think it, 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 um, uh, a single organisation can or should own the movement. I think it needs to be a movement and it needs to uh, encompass as many corners of our society and the people of Scotland as it possibly can. Yeah, yeah. Well, I love, well, Aberdeen was uh, way ahead of you on the language uh, a while ago because we've got I Aberdeen already. We've had that for quite a while. That used to be, yes, too, like one of the founders is here at the back. She's shy, so she's probably want to say hello. <laughs> Uh, apart, apart from that, um, I, well, the language is important, it's part of your identity and we should definitely use that because it hits your subconscious, your language. If you speak to somebody in a, an accent you're used to, it's subconscious, you connect with them. If you use posh language because you're thinking that the Scots language is a, a, a superior enough tongue that you have to talk proper English to be understood to communicate, you're losing you're losing your uh, identity. And people who identify as being Scottish will be likely to support independence because they'll recognise themselves as being Scottish. And the stuff about the Indy First, um, I'm in the Alba party and as far as I'm aware, we're the only party that has a, a credible strategy for independence. I support any, anybody who's interested in independence, obviously. That's what we're all here for, but at the moment we are the only party that has a, a strategy to deliver independence and that would be if we get enough votes in an election, any election going forward, that will be a mandate for us to begin negotiations on independence and we'll confirm it with a referendum of the people after it will be run in Scotland by Scotland. Yeah. Boy. I think we have to remember that uh, there's a golden thread for independence that's run from the Union, the time of the Union, right up until now. It only manifested itself as a political party in the late 1930s. But before that, and if you read, there's a marvellous book by, a, by Dr James D. Young called The Rousing of the Scottish Working Class, and it outlines the history of the national movement in Scotland and how, in reality, the central part of that national movement are the ordinary working people of this country. It's only when those who have the ambitions to be part of the British state formed themselves into political parties and forgot those people behind them that kept the flame alive during the years there were no parties. They forget that those are the people who will deliver in independence. And what I'm seeing now particularly from the Scottish National Party, is a desire, an actual desire, to keep the, mo the movement fragmented. The reason for that is very, is very simple. It's personal greed. My, my, my own Member of Parliament is currently suddenly discovering he's having to actually fight for his seat for the first time. Because all the work that we did all those years ago that created a, a solid base for him to, to live it up in London, so now they're pulling out every possible strategy to get people back in, except they will not work with anyone who is not a Scottish National Party member or a Business for Scotland supporter. 
And that effectively is a deliberate wedge driven between the people and the political class. Because Business for Scotland is part of the political class. Uh, you know, you're all well aware that there's a kind of many industries developed since 2014. The indie business, you know, that uh, borrows, begs money from people on a regular basis and then delivers nothing. But says to us, go and marches which are in direct competition with that golden thread movement, the all under one banner, is an example of that historic golden thread that is the ordinary people wanting something. What, I, what, 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 what appears to be the situation at the moment is the SNP, the leaders of the SNP, are prepared to lose seats and lose votes as they have since 2017 until now. They're prepared to do that to keep a certain core still employed. And it's primarily because they have wasted, or was wasted under the, the, the Sturgeon and Murrow uh, dictatorship, they spent a huge, huge amount of money on what is effectively vanity projects. They have no money to fight for independence, certainly. And they've got very little money to fight this coming general election. So what they're prepared to do is, they're prepared to let people go on the marches that they, they know or the business for Scotland straight into the coffers of the SNP. And they're prepared to sacrifice a certain amount of members of the parliament so that they get the short money from London, from, the West, from Westminster, so they can fight the 2026 election. That's what this is all about. And they've made a calculation. I'm absolutely certain of that. There are certain seats they're quite, they're, they're blasé about losing. And I think they're going to lose fairly heavily. And the reason for that is the disconnection. They're utterly and completely disconnected from the people. They see themselves as above the people. They do not wish to be in contact with the people. Hence, they can say things like, we live in a country full of hate. Yeah. Well, I think actually what's happened here today proves that we can be Scotland United. I was happy at the start of this programme to introduce SNP, Alipa, no party, no party. And I don't know out here how many people are no party who are SNP, and I don't care. As long as you believe in independence, uh, I, I think that's the way forward. And I think one of the greatest policies, the best policy, that, uh, apart from independence, that the Alipa party had was Scotland United. And I don't know whether we call it Scotland United, the Yes Group, Indie, for, it doesn't matter. We, we, we cannot beat the Brits disunited. We have to be united. And I don't, I hope that Indie First is the key to it. I know the people in it and I trust them, but I hope that everyone buys into it or some such, someone comes up with a better one if they like, because we need to be united to beat the Brits. That's a fact, an absolute fact. <laughs> On which, here's a nice one. <laughs> Denise, you're in the naughty step. <laughs> do we think that Humza will survive until 2026? What do you think, Charlie? Well, do you care for a start? I hope not. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think uh, for the for the sake of Scotland and, and for the SNP, really, um, I think the, the SNP need to have a look at the whole upper echelons and pretty much get rid of them all because I don't see anybody in the top of the SNP doing what the SNP members would want. I think, uh, I think like if, if the SNP did their job, there wouldn't be an Alba party again. So we want independence, we're not after the same thing. We need to get it done and I think Hamza needs to jog on and do something else. <laughs> <laughs> Gavin, what do you think? Hamza, can you, I ask you the question, one, do you care and do you think he'll survive? Well, I'm not sure I care, uh, to, to, to be absolutely honest. Um, it's, it's, it's been, it's, it's sad to see what's going on in, in the SNP, how it's uh, um, a little clique of people who all think the same way, uh, seem to be running everything. Um, in, in, in a way, I'm, I'm sort of looking away in embarrassment and uh, I, I do hope they sort themselves out at some point. Um, but I, I've lost I've lost any any um, hope that the SNP as a party would sort of somehow rise and, and, and fix themselves. That seems to be less and less likely as time goes on. It just seems to um, 
wander along on the path that it's lost. <laughs> um, I don't know how to fix it. Uh, I don't think they know how to fix it. Um, the, only, the only way that we can get beyond that is probably to get to 2026 and beyond and see, see what happens at the ballot box. What do you think, Eva? I care very much uh, about Hamza Yusuf being the First Minister and I wish with all my heart that he wasn't. And the reason that I care about it is because he's signally incapable of doing the job that Scotland needs him to do. Um, a prime example of this was when he was asked whether Isla Bryson was male or female. And he said, Isla Bryson, Adam Graham, the rapist, is at it. Thereby directly contradicting himself and his party and all the self-identification legislation that comprised the Gender Recognition Reform Bill. He doesn't understand law that he is responsible for creating. You cannot, under self-identification, describe somebody as being at it. The clue is in the word self. You identify yourself. You're not identified by other people. He doesn't even get that. In terms of the hate crime legislation, he's quoted this week as having said that there will not be vexatious complaints. What a lot of tosh. The police know there will be vexatious complaints. It is known internationally, uh, as far away as Australia and South Africa, journalists have been writing about this hate crime legislation and saying how dreadful it is. But he's defending it. He's been contradicted by the police who've confirmed that they will investigate every single complaint, while at the same time they don't have the resources to investigate other crimes which are arguably far more serious than hurt feelings. So, my, my dad was born in a, a tied house, a cooperative house. When his dad died, the family were evicted. Thankfully, they got a council house. My mum was born in a farm worker's cottage, so getting a council house was a godsend to her family. They both grew up after the Second World War when we had an NHS that became something to be proud of, of international renown. And Scotland was considered to be a good place for all the right reasons, because we had socialist, we had communist representatives, but we had community spirit, and we were a country that should have been going places when oil was discovered in 1969. And where we are now, Hamza Yusuf is, Scotland's certainly going somewhere, it's going rapidly downhill, and that has got to stop. The quicker Hamza's out of that job, the better. Boy. Is, is your party leader? Um, Indeed. And uh, would you think he'll survive? No, I think uh, his wife's pregnancy has come along at just the right time. I think his, uh, uh, the, the, the agreement with the Scottish Parliament to allow the First Minister to take paternity, maternity leave, however you want to describe it, he won't come back. I don't believe he'll come back from that. Uh, I think there are. I don't think he'll be doing it entirely just for uh, out of the goodness of his heart. I think he will be forced not to come back. Um, I think manoeuvres are already being made by by certain people who have previously attempted to be leader of the Scottish National Party. Uh, I also think he's come to the end of his usefulness because the tightness of the the, the leadership group at the top of the Scottish National Party is tight because they all know something and they have to keep it tight between them. Because when one of them breaks and the dam bursts or a court case happens, then the whole sorry story of the corruption of the leaders of the Scottish National Party of the past nine to 10 years will become public. I don't think he wants to be there. I think what he's doing at the moment is he's uh, looking for a way out. And I don't think it is, uh, shall we say, any accident that he regularly now puts out small films of himself being an extremely religious Muslim. I think he's seeking a job in the international world and I think he has probably been told that there's a job out there for him. Remember, you know, his, his big opposite number, uh, Mr. Sarwa. Now remember, these two guys have been in competition with each other since they were at school. Their families were in competition before that, their fathers were in competition. Anas Sarwar's father became the governor of a province of Pakistan. 
Hamza's not quite got that position yet. His family don't have quite that status to get the governorship in Pakistan. But I'm sure that there's a job out there waiting for him. And I think he's angling for one at the moment. <laughs> I've got to say, when I heard he did an interview with Celtic Slippers, though, and I thought he should have been immediately fired, but that's... <laughs> Uh, here's another one. It's a very good question. Listen, the clock's ticking on, folks. If you've got a question, get it in quick. Um, but here's one. Given the age demographic, for example, in this room, and the experience... Um, <laughs> I, just read the, I just read the questions. It was him. Uh, well, what do we think to get the 20 and 30-year-olds uh, who seem to think that independence will just happen? How do we get them out to help? start with you in this time, Lloyd. It's, it's, it's a real problem at the moment. There's no question about that. Um, there's, a, there's a level of disengagement, but also because younger people are feeling the austerity in, to a far greater degree than maybe some of us in this room are. I mean, I'm a pensioner, but it's not hitting me quite the same way as younger folk. I, mean, my, I speak to my daughter about it, and she, I mean, she's, she's, she's below 20, but they bought the idea of the inevitability. You know, all these people who say, oh, independence is inevitable now. That was possibly the stupidest thing that anyone could say. Of course it's not inevitable, as the past nine to ten years have shown us. What's inevitable if your political leaders will not take the steps to make it happen? Is it just going to, what, is it going to drop down the chimney of Santa Claus? <laughs> and, and, and seriously, what makes it inevitable? You need an event. You need to take the action. You need people to progress the, the actions required to achieve our independence. There's a necessity of negotiation. A plan, even, for independence would be good. But this, and whoever said it first, made a big mistake. A big, big mistake. Because it's easy to put that question into people or put that idea into people's minds and they just think to themselves, well, I don't have to do anything. It's just, it's going to happen. It's not inevitable. We need to campaign. We proved that in 2014. When we did, those of us that were born here, voted for the independence of our country. That should have been, and, and here again, back to the golden thread of the working people. Those same people who came out in their numbers to vote in the referendum because they saw the benefit of what we would have achieved with independence, went on to come out at the Westminster election that followed in 2015, in huge numbers. I know this is particularly in the area I worked in, where, you know, effect, effect, effectively, turnout was down below 40%. It hit way beyond 80 in the referendum and stayed just below 80 for that following Westminster general election. We asked people why, <laughs> because they believed that the people who said it was inevitable would go to Westminster in numbers and immediately do what people had asked them to do on September the 18th, 2014, that they would move to independence. Inevitability requires us all to talk to people. Every campaign starts with talking. It's either knocking on the door or standing in the queue at the supermarket. But we have to get that talk happening again, not just in a room with us that are believers. We need to be out there and we need to be talking to the younger members of our family. And the first thing you have to say to them is, no, it's not inevitable unless you get involved. Unless you get involved, unless you demand it, and you force your politicians, and let's hope, independent candidates for independence will be that stick that pokes the politicians in the back to make them realize that there is no inevitability, most especially when you're dealing with a British state. Charlie, how do we get the 20 and 30 year olds enthused? Um, I think uh, part of the problem is that the younger people are, like you say, probably too worried about paying their bills and they're having to work. Older people tend to have more time on their side, so that's why we're all here. <laughs> but um, for sure, if you have a, a target, a date, a campaign, something to work for, as soon as you've got that, if you build it, they will come. Okay? That will happen. The, the, the young folk will come when there's something to come for. There's been nothing to come for for the last six, seven, eight years or so. We really need a, a 
some movement at the and top, and which yeah. is stagnated, and what was stagnated, all the decades and decades of hard work that was done has been unrolled. So we've got to keep that. I mean, we're just like uh, treading water to keep afloat just now. We need to start swimming. A quick question to you, ladies and gentlemen, it's up to you. Um, the clock is beginning to beat us, but we can, if you wish, carry on. But we can take a break and start again. If you want us to carry on, um, please let me know. Okay. So, if I say we take a wee ten minute break, you can fill your glasses, think up some questions, and uh, we can go and powder our noses, and then we'll, we'll reconvene in ten minutes at ten past. Thank you that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy.